I was getting closer. I recognized the trees as those of my childhood. I was missing Mama, but not my life. My memories were taking on a tint I did not like. Stark details stood out that I wished would fade into obscurity. Was that my wish? To forget it all? Did I want to return to life as it was, knowing what I knew now? (sighs) The haven of my memories seemed much smaller. Smothering. This world was vast and full of terror, and yet... There were no walls. I could see the horizon. The woods were becoming dense, the road beneath me dwindling to a patchy footpath. Light trickled down through the thick canopy of leaves, and the ground grew spongy beneath my feet. The path converged with a stream, crisscrossing back and forth across the gently sloping water. Over my shoulder, there was a rustle of leaves. I stopped walking and stood still, listening. The rustling continued and I whirled to face it. A sizable possum ambled across the path behind me, with four babies clutching for dear life to her belly. One of the babies began to slip, and the mother paused while the little one regained its grip. She resumed her walk, and disappeared into the brush. I swallowed against the lump in my throat. I opened my pack, a satchel I had taken from the mud guppy, and fished out some dried meat. The bag smelled like the ship, like gunpowder and water and blood. And when I arrived in Haven, I planned to bury the bag in the woods and forget about it. I chewed on the jerky while I walked, wishing I felt more relief at my proximity to Haven. Soon I came upon a clearing with three trees in the center, one small, two tall. The small tree's boughs arched towards the large ones. One of the big trees shielded the small one with its branches, and I wondered if the little tree got enough sun. The other extended its arms to the sky. A gust of wind blew and the boughs bent, releasing small flowers and pollen. The small white petals swirled and dispersed over the meadow. And that was what it was. This place was vast and full of terrors, yes, but also capable of such beauty. These trees were not manicured by man to please him. They were beautiful by nature. I reluctantly followed the path out of the clearing and back into more woods. Soon, I was in another clearing, and I rested briefly in the shade of another small copse of young trees. Bugs buzzed around my head, and I swatted at them absently. I stood and readied myself for the final stretch. I was very drawn to these trees, and part of me did not want to leave them. When I was quite small, I would explore the ruined dome, perhaps because it was expressly forbidden. One morning, I was poking around the dome's base, searching for strange treasures, when a loud crack snapped through the sky. I huddled for a moment, fearing that it was the exaltation, and I had suspected that I had not repented far enough to outweigh the sin of being born. When nothing happened, I ventured towards the source of the sound, A tree had fallen, crashing into the top of the wall that protected Haven. Stones crumbled down from where they had been knocked loose, and the tree rested about halfway down the height of the wall. Most importantly to me, I could just glimpse what lay outside the wall. I jumped, hoping to see more, but glimpsed only a flash of green. I huffed to myself, looking around. 
there was no one in sight. And outside of the wall looked very green and very wild, and I wanted to see more. An idea blossomed in my mind, and I congratulated myself for my resourcefulness. I hiked back to the ruined dome and examined it. Yes, most of the sides were worn and smooth, but some of the stone had broken off in small divots, and my hands and feet were little and tenacious, and soon I was perched on top of the dome. It was perfect. I could see clearly through the V carved out by the tree. The wilds had no walls that I could see. Lush, rolling hills and forest dotted the landscape. If I strained, I could make out collections of small structures. My breath hitched in my throat. I hugged my knees and imagined myself walking through the woods with no one expecting anything of me and being disappointed when I failed them. My eyes landed on a clearing lit bright green by the sun. A single tree with beautiful white blossoms arched its branches towards me. I stared at the tree and imagined myself tired after a long day of exploration, resting under the shade of its leaves. I closed my eyes and I could feel its bark digging into my back. I smiled to myself. Then, a shout. I started and almost lost my balance. Widow Grayson glared at me from the foot of the dome. She informed me that my mother was going to hear about this, and so was the council, and oh, would I be punished severely. She stomped off, and I did not want to be caught playing in the ruins, so I slid down and ran home through the woods. I scrambled down to the cellar and crouched in the dark, jumping every time I heard footsteps on the road outside. All the waiting had my eyelids heavy and my head bobbing. The cellar doors creaked open, and my head snapped up. Mama and Elder Rice entered, and Mama approached me cautiously. She asked me if I knew they were looking for me. I lied and said I had no idea, and then Elder Rice stomped forward and slapped me hard. Stars burst in my eyes and I held my jaw. Mama gasped and grabbed his arm, pleading him to show mercy. I blinked away the twinkling and corrected myself. I muttered that I knew that they were looking for me, and I was very sorry for disobeying the rules and playing on the ruins. Mama shook her head and said that is not why I was in trouble. She looked to Elder Rice. He knelt in front of me and took my chin in his strong hand. We have worked very hard to keep our home safe, to keep you from even knowing what evil dwells in the wilds, for such knowledge would destroy your spirit. And for you to spit in our faces by staring with such covetous eyes at what you can't even comprehend. He trailed off, turning away in disgust. I gulped. I promised him with a shaking voice that I did not covet, that I was just looking, but the lie tasted bitter on my tongue. He whirled around and stalked to me, grabbing my shoulders and shaking me. Mama cowered behind him, covering her face with her trembling hands. You covet, and you spew falsehoods. He growled. Fury radiated off of him. I scrunched my eyes closed and waited for a blow did not come. He let go of me and was very still. He took in the dark cellar. Perhaps after some more time in here, what we've built for you will look more beautiful. I jumped to my feet, realizing with horror what he meant. He motioned for Mama to leave and they were gone. And then the lock clicked. I think I screamed for hours. Hunger burned in my belly, and my fists were sore from banging on the door. Shadows whispered my deepest fears to me, and the only sleep I got was fraught with terrible dreams. I awoke with the sound of Mama opening the cellar door. Although Elder Rice was the one that locked me in there, I was more mad at Mama for just crying and cowering. I was embarrassed by her weakness. I did not understand that she was strong in ways I couldn't remember in my anger. 
I ran past her into the blinding sunlight, stumbling but keeping my chin high. I don't think I spoke to her for days. But when Elder Rice offered me a gentle smile at that night's council meeting, I smiled back, relieved at his kindness. Haven did look more beautiful after that. The space I had to run around and explore within the walls seemed much larger than that cellar. Still, I would sometimes sneak to that part of the wall, which had been fixed almost immediately, and place my hand to the new stonework. The rolling hills and the forests and the beautiful tree floated in my mind, and my stomach would knot with longing. Then I would remember the cellar, and I would run away, forgetting the life I had dared to imagine outside of Haven. As I walked now, I marveled at the moss beneath my feet and the dappled sun beaming through the trees. Although I had just rested, I was feeling something close to tired again. It wasn't that I felt exhausted, but more that I wanted to fall and let the world catch me. For what would going back to Haven accomplish, really? I trudged into yet another clearing, this one empty of trees. The stream fanned out into milky green shallows, and I tossed my pack to the ground. I would wash here. I removed my clothes and folded them neatly, piling them on a flat rock. I waded into the water, its icy burn knocking the breath out of me. The cold pierced my bones, and I held my breath and submerged myself until I couldn't take it anymore. I burst through the surface and filled my lungs with air. I felt a sense of, I don't know, relief that I could exist in the same world as this place. That if I wanted to, I could grab a stone from the bottom of the stream and clutch it to my breast and sit there until the sun went down and then rose again, until moss started to grow on my skin and I became a relic of the wilds. I scrubbed my skin with the smooth stone. My teeth started to chatter, so I returned to the riverbank and let the sun dry me. I started towards where my clothes waited. My feet felt very heavy, and I scanned the tree line ahead of me wearily. Up on the hill ahead, a white line of stone. <sighs> Haven. My thoughts swam. Haven was not home. I had lived more in the wilds than I had in Haven. I was a part of the wilds and the world. Haven seemed small. My arms itched and I brushed at them unconsciously. I froze, my fingers brushing my skin. It was rough and cracked. I looked down. My arms were covered in bark. I tried to scratch it off, but it hurt. I tried to step back, but my feet were hard to pull from the ground. My heart pounding, I wrenched my foot back with all of my strength, stumbling, and it slowly tore from the ground. Long brown tendrils flowed from the sole of my foot and gripped clumps of dirt. Roots. I tried to pull my other foot from the ground, but it held fast, and my newly planted foot instantly anchored me again. Something flashed white in the corner of my eye. I brushed at it with wooden hands and fingers that extended alarmingly. It was my hair, which now floated towards the sky in billowy blooms. My eyesight began to change. It was not the sharp lines and colors I knew, but rather a muted knowing, a being. Despair burned dully in my chest, and I let out a small sob. And yet, it felt as if I were mourning the loss for someone else, for my anger was quickly fading. I looked to the walls of Haven now with none of the fire that had brought me there. I reached for them, mourning the death of the rest of my journey. 
My heart beat hard, and then stopped. And then I was still. I do not know how much time passed. Bugs burrowed at my feet, and squirrels raised families in my heart. Wind rustled my leaves and rain pelted down on me in tears of relief. I felt for the first time peace. I was the wilds. I was the stream. I was the ground Haven was built on. I scanned the wall with mild interest. I chuckled softly to myself, my bows swaying. That wall was meant to keep me in. Or, I supposed now, to keep me out. The hubris of those stone walls was laughable in comparison to my eternity. I dug my roots deep into the earth and stretched, and a tree near the wall tipped, crashing into man's insult to my omnipotence. The stone tumbled. Then, I slumbered. A brown flash at the wall caught my attention. A messy mop of chestnut hair. A young girl, perched on a tilted white dome, peering over the wall. Her eyes were bright and her cheeks were flushed. I remembered the shocked joy I felt when I glimpsed beyond the wall for the first time. There was so much I did not even know I wanted. I bent my branches towards her. Impossibly, I hoped desperately that this little girl was me. Could I have given someone hope? However dormant it would lie in her breast until it exploded into flames that threatened to devour her? My heart beat once, hard. In her eyes was the fire that burned down Mr. Waterman's house. A girl who could survive ghosts and powerful men and madness and who deserved to finish her journey. And then she was gone, and my boughs bent until they snapped, and I was holding myself and weeping. With a beastly howl, I ripped my feet from where they were planted. They no longer gripped the ground, and I tore off the withered roots. The bark sloughed off my skin as if I were a garden snake. My heart thundered in my ears. The moon hung large and yellow in the dark blue sky. I crouched and re-examined my memories with new clarity. During the trial, Elder Rice testified that he found me unconscious, clutching Mama's dead body. But why had he even come in? He had just visited for his monthly rounds the day before. How did he know to discover my crime? Other, darker memories flitted by. A day when I was about 15, when he squatted by me in the garden reaching over to straighten my sunbonnet. Me, frozen. My breath caught in my throat as my mind raced. My mother's face, pale in the window. Their raised voices, harsh in the wind. Mama's guarded face at dinner. Her fierce hug that startled the air out of my lungs her feverish eyes boring into mine. He was doing something wrong. And I wanted to protect the little girl I was as much as my mother had tried and failed to. I had seen Elder Rice's anger, but also the way he had calmly held my emotions in his palm. I used to treasure the fact that I shone to him a pretty bauble. But that was it, wasn't it? 
that he saw me as a thing he could put away. He didn't see me as a person who could survive. I searched the riverbank, and I found my clothes and belongings tucked under a rock. I dressed thoughtfully, while wild dogs yipped in the night. There was also the question of my poisoning. Only one person knew about my afternoon teas with Mama. We had let only one person close enough to know. Mama had died by Elder Rice's hand. Why? The elders knew that I would face terrible dangers. The wild dogs yipped louder, probably excited to eat a mother rabbit and leave her baby starving to death in their burrow. I could have died the prey of anything I had encountered during my exile. I could have been eaten by those wild dogs, their jaws snapping my bones and their tongues licking out my marrow, while the elders gorged on roast beast, animal fat dripping down their chins as their teeth scraped rib bones. Exile was not a gift from Elder Rice. Exile was a death sentence that I thanked him for after he killed my mother, while the council congratulated themselves on their benevolence. But by sending me into the wilds to die, they turned me into the very thing that would destroy them. I tightened the straps on my pack and walked towards Haven's walls. I would kill them all. Exile was written, performed, produced, and mixed by me, Kelly Nugent. The beautiful music that elevates this story to something I could have never imagined it could be was composed by the ever-talented Annalise Nelson. If you liked this show, please, please, please leave a kindly review on Apple Podcasts or tell your lover or friend or enemy about this show, uh, I would really, really appreciate it. 